the most popular Minnesota candy is <laughs> hot tamales. <laughs> Welcome to this modern education podcast that explores learning from the everyday exchange of thoughts and ideas to the theories and practices behind entire systems. Think education is cool? So do we. So we pair two conversations, learn about our guests, then learn from our guests, share your takeaways, and come back for more. You're listening to Think, Pair, Share with me, Audrey Scott. Will Newkirk is the director of the American Indian Catholic Schools Network at the University of Notre Dame. Previously, he served as the assistant director for the Institute for Educational Initiatives, where he also worked on the pastoral team for the Alliance for Catholic Education's Teaching Fellows Program. A proud Minnesotan, his deep and wholehearted commitment to social justice inspires as he strives to help bring about truth and healing in word and in deed. It is my great pleasure to welcome him to Think Pair Share today. Hi, Will. Hey, great to see (laughs) you. Great to see you too. Thank you so much for being here. Good to be with you, Audrey. Happy Friday. (laughs) Happy football Friday. That's true. They're in for a cool evening tomorrow night, I think. I'm not loving that, but I I guess we'll just all have to make do and get out our scarves and mittens. But yeah, um, people can cuddle in inside and listen to our podcast following. Ooh, I like that very much. <laughs> that means a very quick edit for you. <laughs> I was just going to say, of course, then it means I won't be able to go to the game because I'm going to quickly be working on it. Um, but it's always a good idea to, to sort of uh, sit by the fireplace uh, and with a hot cup of joe um, <laughs> and listen to the podcast. So um, thanks. This is going to be a, a great conversation. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, well, really appreciate the opportunity. It's just your luck, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, that it is October. And so that means sort of Halloween. Um, mm-hmm. That is the theme of the grab bag, like it or not. Right. Uh, today. I'm a so. big fan of the grab bag so far with Andrea Christensen yeah. and Matt Clover. So oh, this good. is uh, high pressure, but uh, privilege, <laughs> pressure is a privilege, as Billie Jean King says. So I'm excited to to get a shot at this grab bag. Oh my gosh, great quote. And no pressure, it's just all fun, okay, I hope. Great. But um, I like the idea of a grab bag too, because I just put a bunch in, so I kind of know mm-hmm. what's in there. But yeah, thanks to Matt Closer sort of stepping up our game. Absolutely. Uh, and Andrea did, well, she was such a good sport and did so well. So here is the bag itself. Oh, wow. Little... Okay, great. I didn't know there was an actual bag. <laughs> an actual bag. Or bag, as I say with my Minnesota accent. Yes, and we're going to get to that actually a little special treat. <laughs> oh, a special treat for you great. for Halloween. So let's see, I guess. Okay. I hope we pick out the one I'm talking about, at least. We all know some of the standards for Halloween, um, but mm-hmm. I thought I'd try to pick a few more sort of obscure facts or at least right. obscure to the survey of one, me, <laughs> as I was <laughs> making them up or finding them. So um, so yeah, some more quirky ones, I think. Okay, great. Okay. We love quirky. Okay, good. True or false? Candy corn was originally called chicken feed. True. Ooh, one for one. Excellent. <laughs> that was so quirky. I just had to go through. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Makes oh, me even love- more concerned about what that is that we put into our bodies this time of year. But I think it's the candy people love to hate, but um, I guess there's something nostalgic about mm-hmm. it for me. So I usually tend to to get a bag of it, which is weird because I think it is on people's most disliked candy list, but it's also yeah. one of the top sellers. So Interesting. I think people still- yeah. um, It's an odd, odd feeling when your teeth are kind of covered with uh, candy corn. But I, I like to make a fall mix, you know, yes. peanuts, pretzels, yes. M&Ms, and sprinkle, you got to sprinkle a few just, I mean, just to see the candy corn or, or chicken, <laughs> chicken feed, is that what you call it? Chicken feed, yes. Yeah. So whether you like it or not, it's here to stay, I think. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's see what's next. I have to give a little sound effect. <laughs> yeah is that an i it, what is that an i love catholic schools it is actually um uh, just, oh from our yeah, email program from, from email, yeah love that i'll yeah, have to I give do. you an aicsn bag for the next one you know what that's good i should get to yeah. each bag oh i like yeah. it i like it that'd be really good i love the i love the suggestion box Maybe yeah we'll get a brand we're box. always we're always branding we're always marketing <laughs> yes get your american indian catholic schools network swag here. exactly there we go <laughs> we're gonna have to have a link it has to be a pretty big bag to fit that whole title in <laughs> 
I like it though. Which is fun. A big a big grab bag is a good grab bag. <laughs> That's absolutely true. <laughs> Let's see what this uh, next one is. Okay, this one's a little on the spookier side. Good. Hey, I thought honestly, chicken feet. <laughs> that was spooky enough. <laughs> I hope this is a little spookier, but you're right. Maybe maybe candy corn is a little too. Okay. The now infamous Michael Myers mask from the movie Halloween is actually retooled from a real mask. Was it a clown mask, a mummy mask, or a William Shatner mask? Ooh. Okay. That's tricky because even before you gave the options, it's like, oh, it's got to be like an old hockey goalie mask. It's probably an homage to my minnesota heritage um go. okay i guess william shatner <laughs> it's too ridiculous not to be it right yeah that I that was my that was actually the first time <laughs> the thing is i couldn't think of any other famous people from that time but it really is a william shatner mask but the story does include a clown mask i yeah. i'm so scared of clowns my when i was young my family went out to dinner i think at the ground round a clown was walking around i was like Th four five years old giving balloons and yeah. my mom and i had to sit in the car during the entirety of dinner because i i couldn't even be in the establishment so i could never have answered clown that just would have been it would have gone against everything i believe <laughs> so oh glad God. to get it right and glad i didn't have to go that that route wow I, thanks for sharing that story that's yeah, i feel so, so please sorry. <laughs> please no more clown conversation or questions or i have to take a break we'll put pause <laughs> <laughs> okay, I promise. No more, no yeah. more C-L-O-W-N questions. <laughs> well, I'm glad your mom was so good to you. And yeah, that was very outside. kind of her. I That's... hope they brought a doggy bag out to you. <laughs> yeah, I hope I hope they did for her. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Awesome. So at least according to the New York Times, when they um, interviewed, <laughs> uh, I think, uh, Nick Castle, that when shooting the original 1978 film, production designer Tommy Lee Wallace picked up two masks from a Hollywood Boulevard magic shop because they had so little money, apparently. The budget was super small. Small, so they didn't have time to like Times more money. Tough. To... Yeah, exactly. So yeah. <laughs> says Tommy came in with the clown mask on and we all said, that's kind of scary. Then he put on the Shatner mask and we stopped dead and said, oh my gosh, that's perfect. <laughs> so they painted it white and cut the eye holes out oh. a little bit more. And there you have it. So those are good. Two for two. You're doing great. Let's see who brought us jack-o'-lanterns. Was it the Irish, the French or the Danish? Hmm. Oh, wow. Okay. So I am Irish and I take great pride in my, my Irish heritage. And I think you do as well. I do. Um, but I can't say I think of pumpkins in Ireland or in Irish heritage. So uh, I'm going to say the Danish because they're creative and, and, you know, Danish Scandinavian design is so top of the line. I bet, I bet jack-o'-lanterns are a great Danish tradition. I like that thought process very much. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and who knows, but my, maybe they did. But my facts are your home uh, country. Your first uh, idea was the Irish. They're, they're storytellers, I think. Um, so but, when you nodded at me when I said Irish, it wasn't that you agreed of, uh, about our pride of I, our heritage. You actually nodded at me because I was going in the correct <laughs> I did agree with you, and I did think it was the right answer. <laughs> well, so, hey. That's good. From Did they make out. them out of potatoes or out of pumpkins is my, well, my follow-up question here. Yes, I think they did do pumpkins, although I've also read that they did like turnips and things like that too, I ah, think. So yeah, I don't want to miss, um, and all this is sort of what I've been able to garner from different sources. So I apologize ah, if I no. uh, get it wrong. But as at least as the story goes, it says an Irishman named Stingy Jack tricked the <laughs> devil and therefore was not allowed into heaven oh, or hell. So wow. he spent his days roaming the earth carrying a lantern. Hence the Jack O Lantern. I was gonna say O oh, Lantern. That makes yes. a lot of sense. Um, okay. So who knew? I mean, I thought it was a cute little story, if nothing else. It's very um, cute. And we'll give you like two and a half credit because you did mention the Irish and you okay. were that possibly makes feel better. To okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, good. Good deal. Is this like uh wait, wait, don't tell me where <laughs> the points don't really matter? Exactly. Okay, <laughs> I good. I love I love that. <laughs> I do too. I do too. Did you see it live? I did. I was. Yeah, I used to live awesome. in Chicago, so I did get to go. It was so it was so fun. I really so loved it. Funny. Yeah. I'm so glad it's continuing to have such great success. I just think Peter Sagal is like one of the funniest people, and the questions are hilarious. And sometimes people get them right, sometimes they don't. But it's not what it's all about. <laughs> it's not what it's all about. It's the fun banter, the stories you're sharing. Yeah. I won't. I won't hearken the back. bits and banter, as Matt <laughs> Closer and... said on episode 21. <laughs> We're gonna have to trademark that. I told him right away. I'm like, trademark that and trademark this Moore's idea. Yeah, that's right. Okay, boom. 
It's more than coffee. That's that's. <laughs> a, I'm trademarking it here, people. That's a mat closer thing. Let's try one more. Do we? Have, let's try, have time. Oh, for I one thought more. this whole thing was only grab bag. <laughs> That's what that's what oh, Matt shoot. <laughs> that's what Matt wanted. And I'm sure yeah. that's not what Andrea wanted. She's like, oh God, <laughs> can we get to the I, I'm still thinking about coffee ice cream from her. Oh bird grab it's, eggs. it's so good. Okay, well, so we'll do one more. Oh my gosh. Okay. Multiple choice. This is a multiple choice one. America's top 10 Halloween candies. Okay. So I'll give you five choices and you have to pick the top one. Okay. So MMs, Reese's Cups, Starbursts, Sour Patch Kids, or Skittles. Hmm. Very interesting. M&Ms for sure. Like personally, I would enjoy, mm -hmm. but my folks would always buy like Skittles and Starburst because they didn't like them as much. So they'd be less likely to eat them. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah. I've never thought of that. Yeah. So uh, Reese is very popular as well. Um, my wife yes. historically has not loved the chocolate peanut butter combo, but recently has oh. really come to love it. So all of these have some good merit to them. I don't think Sour Patch Kids are just quite as popular, although I, they're excellent. Yeah. I think M&Ms might be split, kind of split ticket with peanut M&Ms. That's true. And I think Reese's can be tricky with the peanut with peanut allergies. So mm. I'm going down to Skittles and Starburst. And it's been a long time, very long time since I've trick-or-treated. I want to make that on the record. <laughs> it's been a very long time. But I think they're are a lot of the little two-piece Starburst packages. Uh, so I'm going to go with Starburst as the number one Halloween candy. I love your mentality on this. And actually, you're very close. Oh. I'm say, uh, you're also going to get partial credit on this. But I read an article this year that said Skittles overtook Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. And I was surprised because I love Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Um, yeah, I but, do. But your thought process about it was very good, which is a lot of people are allergic yeah. um, more so than I think. When... I guess that doesn't make the rest of America too concerned. <laughs> I mean, I like Skittles, but... Yeah, taste the rainbow, as I think the most says. And, and they are good ones. Then I, I snuck a couple and I was like, wow. They're and kind then, of refreshing too. They're very refreshing. And actually around um, Ace, they're uh, so hospitable. I have all mm. those candy dishes everywhere. Mm. And Skittles do tend to sort of pop up uh, quite often in those. So yeah. I've uh, enjoyed a fun size pack myself uh, now and again. But, um, but yeah, so I guess um, I couldn't really decide. Most places still say Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, but Skittles is definitely rising on the charts. Okay. Okay. Bonus question for you. Okay. I found another article that says top candy in each state. So since we have so nicely already mentioned Minnesota as your home state, <laughs> do you have any idea what is your state's top one? And I do not think you're going to get it. Um, is <laughs> it a nut goodie? Ooh, no, but what the heck is that? I think that's right. <laughs> I don't think it's very famous. I think that might be made regionally. It's like a marshmallow oh. um, peanut type of kind of yeah it's very it's quite delicious um, well, I think okay. this is a little bit more national than that I think but it okay. certainly <laughs> feels like it's not I'm gonna tell you because I don't I think it's super random hot tamales that is very interesting I would not have guessed that although my dad definitely would pick up some hot tamales from like Menards or Fleet Farm or like you know kind of like really? a home improvement store definitely really some hot tamales in in the car so I can see that. I think I have okay. evidence of that. Maybe because it gets so cold in the winter, the hot tamale kind of is an extra <laughs> blast of warmth. Heat them from the inside out. Like exactly. exactly. <laughs> okay, great. And so this is where you um, also get bonus points in Indiana. Number one, Starbursts. There we go. See, I was basing it off my, my uh, local region. So, yes. So I got to think local always. I think you're getting like full point on that. Plus you had the bonus from, from the hot tamales. I think we're, I think we're five for five. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> six for five, honestly, I think. <laughs> yes. Six for five. You're the only one that scores high. I, so we'll just stop there. Thank you. Audrey. It's been, it's been a really great conversation. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time. Well, have a wonderful weekend. <laughs> Go Irish. Have a blessed day. <laughs> Sorry. You're not that lucky. You're, you're, you gotta no, stay for a little no. bit longer. Great. Uh, well, grateful no. to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, but actually, I think this is a good segue because we are talking about Minnesota and I'd like to kind of bridge that that gap and say, hey, take mm -hmm. us a little bit on that path from wh where you started out to, to Notre Dame and, and what you're doing now. And I realize that that's an enormous question, but if there's a way for you to kind of just uh, let us know a little bit about that, um, sure, appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
So as I have mentioned numerous times, which in uh, anyone who knows a Minnesotan gets annoyed with this, we always talk about our home. So I'm from Rochester, Minnesota, which is in southeastern Minnesota. Many people know it because of the Mayo Clinic. Um, but I was one of the, the few kids at school whose parents didn't work at the Mayo Clinic. Both my parents were uh, and are teachers. They're educators. My dad taught at a local public school and my mom taught at a local Catholic school, St. Francis of Assisi, and my dad taught at Pinewood. And I think that's super important um, in so many ways, but in a yeah. life, um, in a vocation really uh, rooted in education, I think there's no yeah. coincidence that my parents are both educators. My dad just retired last year and my mom is still teaching. So that uh, is a huge part of my path and call. And yeah. I went to Catholic school all along, went to St. Francis Lourdes High School, and then I went to college at St. John's University in Minnesota. So I'm a Johnny. As yeah, as yeah. Uh, people say, our our rivals are Saint Olaf the Oli, Saint Thomas the Tommies, Gustavus the Gusty. So, <laughs> lots of creativity in the Division Three Mayak Conference, and then of course Saint Ben's, which is connected with Saint John's. Saint Ben's would be the Bennies, as you can guess. So, oh my gosh, <laughs> Hamlin are they're not called the Hammies, so that's good. Um, <laughs> but long story short, I am a, a Johnny and super formative experience. Um, Benedictine Small Liberal Arts School. Uh, just came to uh, really just love that community so much and learned so much um, from being there. Yeah. And really, my experiences there felt uh, a growing call kind of to service and social justice, um, which I I definitely kind of, I think, was inspired in my early years at a school like St. Francis, you know, mm -hmm. what better model of social justice with parents as educators and in high school as well. Um, Yes. My bet, my best buddies, uh, their mom was a campus ministry director, and mm. so she she invited us often to service opportunities. So just continually feeling service and the connection to education. While at St. John's, I learned more about this program called ACE, uh, the Alliance for Catholic Education. I was really drawn to the spiritual component, the service component, the teaching component, the living in community space, and it's called ACE service or teaching at that point. And so. Had some really formative experiences at local schools and service and prison ministry and going to a, a Native American reservation, the White Earth Nation. Um, and, and all of those experiences were really kind of calling me to something deeper. And I felt like ACE was that call. And I had studied political science and history, super jazzed to teach high school social studies. I applied and I was so thrilled and humbled to get in. And then I got a call from Tulsa, Oklahoma a couple of days later, and she said, Hey, you know that essay where you talked about getting lost in the Boundary Waters canoe trip, like and how you said how kind of the experiences that are far different than you expect. That's exactly the right ones. I said, yes, I do remember that. She said, good, because I know you want to teach high school social studies, but you're going to be our third grade teacher next year. So I said, oh, great. <laughs> I can, oh, no. I was, I was in third grade once. Great. Yeah. This will be awesome. <laughs> I think I remember um, third grade. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Mrs. Abel was an amazing teacher. So, <laughs> so uh, elated to say yes to that. And then I went on to teach through ACE and at St. Catherine school in Tulsa, truly one of my favorite places taught third grade, immensely challenging. I struggled and failed like I never before, but also was met with amazing grace from the families and my colleagues there and ended up staying a third year. So I was three years in Tulsa. Wonderful. And then have been back here working at ACE and the Institute for Education Initiatives for about seven years in a few different roles. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, for the last number of years working with the American Indian Catholic Schools Network, which I think so much of that path is deeply connected to this, this current work and um, work that I just love so much. When the original position opened up, I emailed my family and I, I uh, shared the position description. I said, I think this is my dream job. And it, it really has, it really has been since wow. day one, I think to some great mentorship and just amazing schools and educators and teachers, yes. leaders, students who have given me the immense privilege just to witness their, their heroic work. We are blessed to have you and they are blessed to have you as, as the director of that network. And Maybe we can start with the network a little bit. Tell us about the schools, maybe the the nations that are represented. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. So I'll I'll try to do this concisely, um, and that is something I that is an area for growth in all ways. So, <laughs> and my wife is not here to help me with that, as she often is in <laughs> social studies. So I will uh, I will uh, do my best here. But maybe just a quick history. So, all things considered, this is a pretty new idea and a new experiment um, in a new community. There were five Native American Catholic schools, and, and, and 
a Native American Catholic school we consider is a Catholic school in Indian country on reservations or on the border of, of a reservation or a sovereign indigenous nation, uh, more appropriately, that serves predominantly uh, Native American students. There are probably 23 of these schools left in the country. There were many more at one point. Many of them were boarding schools, and, and I'm sure we'll talk about more kind of the recent, more recent awareness of the horrors and abusive culture of these boarding schools that were run both by the government and the church. And many of those have closed, and so there were far more Native American Catholic schools than there are today. The ones that have remained open, in many cases, are the ones who have modeled culturally responsive pedagogy, who have teachers and leaders representing the community they're from, where the indigenous spirituality and tradition and language is celebrated. So all of those pieces make up uh, a distinctly indigenous and distinctly Catholic school. So we're really proud that these are the schools that have been able to persist. And it's no coincidence that they are the ones who have persisted because they are deeply rooted in their, their local community and celebrate that local community. So there are probably 23 of these schools. Five of them were, were funded by the Sieben or, or now the Better Way Foundation independently. And what the schools were sharing with that foundation was there was a great hunger and need for sure for resources. And these schools are deeply under resourced. But more than that, they needed relationships and solidarity and sharing best practices. And so mm -hmm. what happened is they kind of flipped things around and instead of funding individual projects at schools, they funded the opportunity for the schools to collaborate. And that's where the network was formed, that more than anything, the isolation and challenges of these schools could best be addressed by a sense of community and walking together. And so the network was formed with five schools originally, and it was housed at Creighton, uh, the University of Creighton in, in 2013. And a few years later, in 2017 or 2016, I guess, Brian Collier, along with the leadership at the Institute for Educational Initiatives and ACE, as well as Karen Roundhorse, who's deeply involved in and a leader in the Better Way Foundation, they all came together and thought ACE and with the in the mission of, you know, strengthening, sustaining, and transforming under-resourced Catholic schools, that'd be a wonderful fit. And so in 2017, officially the, the network moved to uh, Notre Dame and in from my experience, I started working in 2018, officially and formally, and fully with the network. It is, it's just a, the deepest and most beautiful mission fit. One of our key priorities in this network is to grow sustainably, incrementally, thoughtfully. And the school, the principals and the teachers from our other schools are really inspired and energized by that. And I love that, that there's such a spirit of inclusion because the more schools that are in the network, which means the more students, the more teachers, the more principals who can share their experiences and walk together in solidarity. And so from the very beginning, the member schools have all been so motivated to welcome new schools in, which is really awesome because you could see there could be more of an exclusive kind of this is working well, let's keep the resources concentrated, but they want mm -hmm. to spread it out. And I think it's an amazing model of what the church can be and what education can be. I know it's even growing. Congratulations. You, you've you just added an eighth school. Yes. St. Yeah, yeah, Anthony's. Exactly. Yes, yep. St. Anthony, yeah. mm -hmm. Indian Mission School in Zuni, New Mexico. Just a really special school down in the Diocese of Gallup serves the Zuni Pueblo and the Zuni community. And so we're very excited. Sister Marsha Moon is just a wonderful woman and a saintly principal. And Sister Kathleen Carr and I, who yes. is the ACE Director of Strategic Partnerships, mm -hmm. who AICSN sits under, we had a wonderful visit there. And we were just, everyone was on the same page that when we were able to add a school, uh, we hope it's St. Anthony and Gratefully, it has all worked out, and then they will be our eighth school. And next month, when we have our full fall leadership summit, where all our school leaders meet together, it'll actually be held in New Mexico, and we'll officially welcome St. Anthony to our community. Oh, wow. What a joyous occasion that's going to yeah, be. It will. It will. Oh. Well, we look forward to highlighting that some more too. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It comes along so good. Do you want me to quickly list them? Would that be yes, okay? Please, great. Please. So we serve, I'll go uh, east to west. So St. Mary's Mission serves the Red Lake Nation, uh, which is the Ojibwe indigenous community that is in Red Lake, Minnesota. St. Augustine, which serves the Winnebago and Omaha nations, and that is in Winnebago, Nebraska. Then we serve two schools in South Dakota, St. Joseph Indian School, which is in Chamberlain, South Dakota. Uh, they serve primarily Lakota students. And then Red Cloud Indian School, which is in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. You, Audrey, have had the privilege of being there. Absolutely. Uh, they're on Pine Ridge and they serve the Lakota, the Pine Ridge Lakota community. Then we have De La Salle Blackfeet, which is mm -hmm. in Browning, Montana, and they serve the Blackfeet Nation. 
Then kind of to the Southwest, we have St. Joseph Mission School is in San Fidel, New Mexico. They serve the Acoma and Laguna Pueblos. Then there's St. Anthony Indian Mission School that serves the Zuni Pueblo. And then St. Charles Apache Mission School, they serve the San Carlos Apache Nation, and that is in San Carlos, Arizona. So that is our full uh, community as of now uh, uh, of eight schools, and we're looking forward to continuing to grow. And uh, you, like we said, incrementally and thoughtfully, but that's the native communities we serve and, and the school communities we serve. Thank you so much. It's important to hear who they are. Yeah, yeah. And I like learning about that. Can you talk a little bit about the origins of what made this possible at the beginning? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Five schools had relationships with the Sieben Foundation, which is part of the JHR umbrella of foundations. And they had that hunger for something more. And it was from the leadership and the Round Horse family of the Sieben Foundation, which is now the Better Way Foundation that they would fund this network, that they would fund the opportunities to bring these schools together and, and for staff to work full time toward this network. And so as the network moved to Notre Dame, the Better Way Foundation played an instrumental role and they continue to do today uh, in making this possible that funding is available to bring these schools together through obviously, as I shared earlier, quite a geographical distance, right? Mm -hmm. um, together in person for a number of opportunities during the school year in the summer, as well as a number of virtual opportunities, as well as the programs we work through as and being able to build team capacity for people to implement those programs. And as that has grown, that grant that we operate is at the heart and soul of what we do. And we work really closely with the Better Way Foundation, with members of the Roundhouse family, with, with board members, and with their team in a very collaborative way, which I think is unique to our partnership. And it really is a deeply mutually beneficial three-way partnership between the, the foundation, ACE, and Notre Dame, and then the schools, which is really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And as we've been able to do that and, and have some proof points of success, we've been able to, you know, slowly but surely um, spread our word and, and share our stories and been able to raise, you know, some more funds. And the Pasquinelli family, a longtime Notre Dame uh, and ACE family who's, who's just a, a really a deeply committed to Catholic schools. They received the, the Notre Dame Prize of Catholic Ed from, from ACE and Notre Dame as well. They recently very deeply generously have helped support our work. And that has played a huge role in first deepening our impact as well as helping to expand. So their support has helped us to invite more schools like St. Anthony in so we can be more inclusive and grow and our community can be enlivened by more educators and more students from, from all over the country. Great. Thank you so much. That helps mm -hmm. really ground things. So and, I really appreciate that. And, and part of that, and with deep support from Better Way and the Pasquinez as well, we've all agreed we need to continue to increase our capacity to have more team members to take on more schools. So we're always looking for more. So uh, okay. I'll, I'll give you my cell phone now for any benefactors listening. No, I'm just kidding. See the show notes afterwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. My, my cell phone, <laughs> email, yes. Zoom links, <laughs> house <That's>... address. <laughs> W. Newkirk. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's great, though. I think part of what we want to do is help get the word out exactly. but you, because you do. You're doing such great work. We've just been met with um, just amazing support and partnerships um, yeah. from those and, and, and many others. You know, and the, and the beautiful thing, I think, about AICSM being housed at Notre Dame is it's it's not about ACE and Notre Dame sharing our story. It's about sharing the story of these schools and facilitating and empowering in a way where the schools are sharing their stories because that's where the courageous heroic work is being done. When you hear those those moments, it is deeply moving. It is really deeply moving. Yes, you are such a genuine, wonderful person who cares deeply. One of the, I know you're not going to love all these compliments, but one of the reasons I think some of that you guys have been so successful is because of that, because the folks you're working with trust you and they know that you're coming from that authentic space um, of care. So I appreciate that. I, I've had the distinct pleasure to be able to work with with you and, and right. the network. Oh, I want to yeah. be able to talk about um, the partnership with Holy Cross a bit too. So anytime I get to interface, it's just been so lovely. Thank you. And, and that's been just such a special part of this partnership is how many units and teams within the Institute for Educational Initiatives and the Alliance for Catholic Education who've been able to interact, the Remick Leadership Program, the Center for STEM Education, the, the communications team, just across the board, 
the units here just talk about how life-giving that partnership has been. And our AICSN folks just talk about the hospitality and the graciousness of the ACE and II team. So that's that's just been, I, I think, a gift for everyone involved. and just kind of helps deepen, hopefully, our beautiful vision of what Catholic education can mean. Absolutely. I think a lot of the work that you do is trying to bring about truth and healing. Mm -hmm. And I think in order to try to do that, it's important to talk about some history, some mm -hmm. complex and challenging history, boarding schools. Yeah. Can you walk us through a little bit of that, sort of where where you see healing taking place? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Or the potential for that? Totally. And you're exactly right. You know, truth and healing is at the heart and a pillar of our work when we've come together for strategic planning and with, with all of our school leaders and in thought and in dreaming about the vision of AICS. And it really comes down to impactful talent formation, providing services to the schools and truth and healing and truth and healing as we think about the intersection of, of Catholic identity and indigenous culture. And so, um, and, and you're right, it, it's very complex and it's it's very heavy. And there's a dark, dark history of the church in indigenous Catholic schools. You know, Pope Francis's visit to Canada this year mm -hmm. was a, a, such an important step, such an important step and, and many different views on how beneficial it was, but more than anything, it it honored the deep, dark tragedy that those schools brought about through abuse and that continued to impact Native families, survivors, as well as their descendants today mm -hmm. through intergenerational trauma. So it is so deeply woven into these communities, both within our schools and within the, the local Indigenous community and context. It, for me, was just uh, such a, a moment of awareness of the trauma that was inflicted in this abusive system and how it continues uh, today and how invisible it is to so many of us who are non-Indigenous and, and and even those of us involved in Catholic education, even those involved in Indigenous Catholic education and how close it hits home for Indigenous Catholic educators and families, uh, whether they are part of the school or not. So if our work aligns with the mission we, we chatted briefly about and, and our vision, we need to be talking about truth and healing. And that these schools need to be vessels of transformational education where healing occurs. Because if we're not combating the intergenerational trauma, then in some way or another, that continues on. And so I really believe deeply, and, and, and so many Indigenous educators have helped me learn about this, is that our opportunity is now to change the story and the narrative and have a process that schools and local families initiate in their own local context. It'll be different from school to school that facilitates a process of truth and healing, of acknowledging the hardships of the past, of working with the church and, and other local leaders and national leaders to work on apologies, to work on um, more deeply indigenizing how the school operates in its Catholic identity, in naming the yeah. families and the students who were victims of this abuse, who might have died of this abuse, who were never properly returned to their families. It is it is heavy and dark, but if we're not rolling up our sleeves to embrace that, these schools aren't going to be able to have the transformative effect that they're starting to today. And that is rooted in and driven by the families and the teachers at those schools. And so, like I said, it's a beautiful opportunity and the beauty of it has to do with embracing the pain of the past. And every school will look different. Like I said, every school has a different history of, of whether it was a boarding school or not, or what the church looked like, but there is no doubt the, the colonial nature of the government and the church's involvement in these communities that there is a place and a space for this to be looked at in each community. One of our schools, Red Cloud, which we've talked about a little bit, they, Macaw Black yes, Elk, who's an amazing friend and leader mm -hmm. within AICSN, he's he's yeah. done the Remick Leadership Program at ACE. His, his job is the Executive Director of Truth and Healing at Red Cloud right now. And he's the perfect person to do it as a Lakota Catholic man and an inspiring person. But not all of our schools are in a place with the resources or mm -hmm. even kind of a strategy to bring this about. Um, so it's going to look different everywhere, but 
our network deeply prioritizes that we can come together and talk about it. And we've been able to do that through um, summer truth and healing sessions where, where people come and learn about it, even in our summer institute that brought people to campus for professional development in person this summer. Um, that was a, a, an important topic. So we want to think about it that every classroom in our schools is a space for, for truth and healing. It's really infused in every aspect of of these schools. And, you know, just for me personally, as a non-Indigenous person, it's so important for me to acknowledge that. But also the darkness of this is really heavy. And I I can't imagine what it is like to carry as survivors or descendants of the boarding schools. Um, because the more and more I work in this, there are so many days where my heart is broken and I have way more questions than answers. And the the deep sadness and tragedy and trauma of it as an outsider and as someone who's part of the settler colonial community right you know um mm -hmm. i i wrestle with that a lot and when i see what these schools are doing and when i see how these schools are talking about and leading and truth and healing there's great hope in that and the more we can witness and follow and and stand as a co-conspirator as i like to say in in that work that they're really directing and leading it yeah. Um, there, there's, there's hope for an amazing, amazing future. I love that idea that there is hope and that with you, us and others working with them, that they believe that there is hope, mm -hmm. um, and that they're willing to, to, um, work with us and help us understand and mm -hmm. learn and acknowledge and yeah. find ways to heal. I think that is very hope. Now yes. you got to save that toward the end because that's where we put the hope part. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, that. <laughs> and one thing that's so important that Macaw has talked about a lot too that I think is really important is that the, this work of truth and healing should be led and directed by Indigenous educators and families, but we can't put the burden of that strictly on those people because that's in some ways saying others or someone in my role doesn't have a role to play and we do mm -hmm. it but it's it's to support that we're not leading it or dictating it or directing it but that's not to say we we're not going to be part of it because we um we have a role and responsibilities to stand with and walk with these schools and these families in this process absolutely um yeah. very well said by Makai and you let's talk about that what what do you or what in in your circles what do you think is the best way to define our role and our responsibility? What what can we do as best next steps, you think? Yeah. So I, I think about this in particular with, with, in my role and in, in, at AICSN and, and the team at ACE, but even beyond that, I think more than anything, what is so crucial is that these stories are witnessed and heard, shared and celebrated. Um, you know, the Indigenous experiences is, is quite invisible to so many within our country. Mm -hmm. um, and that's related to the horrific history of our government and the church and, and with a deeply colonial approach to the first people of, of this place. So many uh, Americans don't think of indigenous communities as present and evolving and um, thriving and struggling today. You know, th I think there's a stat that 90% of American students don't learn anything about the indigenous experience in social studies classes beyond 1900. There are many reasons for that. You know, I, like I said, kind of the approach of, of the government and the church in the past, as well as the rural nature of yeah. indigenous communities generally. So I think more than anything, it's to listen. And I think it's one of my favorite favorite words uh, is to listen. And mm -hmm. St. Benedict talks about at the beginning of his rule, listen with the ear of your heart. And I think those of us who are, are non-Indigenous, whether we're working in this field or not, it's important that we listen to the stories. In listening, we learn and we're educated, right? And, mm -hmm. and we learn about the dark history and we learn about all these truths that we have been blind to, um, that, that we're not part of the narratives we've grown up with. But we also learn about the heroic and courageous work that's happening at the schools today, you know, um, and I think the more that happens, kind of like you, we've talked about these these moving uh, stories and these these inspiring oh. people, mm -hmm. just simply witnessing what they do mm -hmm. uh, has an impact directly and indirectly. And you know, I think about at our schools, there are a number of survivors of boarding schools who are teachers or leaders at these schools. Mm -hmm. 
And I've met a number of them. I'm, I'm working on my, my doctorate at Loyola Marymount's doctoral program for educational leadership through social justice. And my dissertation is going to be about the stories of the survivors of boarding schools who have then chosen mm. to teach in Catholic schools. If you want to talk about truth and healing, talk about the life of these people and mm -hmm. their commitment to their children and their communities that they have given their lives to teach within a Catholic school and system that took them away from their families and, and may have impacted their indigenous, uh, you know, I, I don't want to speak for anyone at, at this point, but impacted their, their life and mm -hmm. their community and their indigenous identity in so many different ways. And so the fact that these people, Lorraine Russell is the principal of St. Charles Apache Mission School and went to a boarding school uh, and mm -hmm. came back to, to San Carlos. She's taught there or led there for over 40 years. And like, what an inspiring person for many of us to learn from. And I think when we listen to those voices and ask them, those folks can give us a great sense of what it means to really walk with them and support them in the way that is deeply respectful and, mm -hmm. and hopefully in, in a way that helps all of us decolonize our lens and, mm -hmm. and just respect a school and its indigenous culture and its indigenous sovereignty in a way where they can truly flourish in the way they dream they could and aim to be. Listen with the ear of your heart. We've talked about this. I do think mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. everybody has a, a very critical story to tell and to share. Sometimes I feel like that's it's good for me to hear that that's a good starting point because I feel like, well, that's not enough. Yeah. What can I do? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that it's important to know that that is something that's welcomed is yeah. to to be open and to listen yeah. and to yeah. be open to that healing and see where we can um, partner with that. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Good, good. Given a lot of the, for lack of a better word, the complexities of um, the history and moving, trying to move forward together and in mm -hmm. healing. Can you help us understand a little bit of the indigenous culture intersecting with the Catholic identity yeah. in these schools? That'd be, mm -hmm. that'd be one. Thanks. Yeah. And I, thinking about that intersection of indigenous culture and tradition and Catholic identity, that's the unique nature of our schools. And that's why in 2013, the schools were calling mm -hmm. for community because it's such a different type of school than anywhere else on the reservation. Far different than a traditional public school where most indigenous students go or Bureau of Indian Education School. And also far different than most other schools in the diocese, pretty much every other school in the diocese. For me, this is something that when we look at, um, this is where you, I, I feel you can see um, glimmers of truth and healing in, in that these schools are celebratory and deeply indigenous while doing that in a way that is infused into a Catholic school, that there's still still a Catholic school. And and like so many pieces, and I mentioned this a bit before, every school looks different. But what we find is, you know, all of our schools are teaching their indigenous language in one way or another. In that. some some cases it's in it through an immersion classroom. Yep. In some cases it's uh, an, an elder coming in mm. and, and teaching. In certain places, it's seeing the Our Father uh, yeah. written in an indigenous, in the Blackfeet language, for example. So there are these beautiful signs of the indigenous culture in these schools. So language is one. Traditional spirituality in, in different ways, uh, the teachings, mm -hmm. the wisdom. I've also seen it in ways where it's connected to the Catholic church, where the, the church at the school has sage burning as kind of a, mm -hmm. a sense of cleaning or, or, or smudging, as Absolutely. they would call. Um, so this collection and celebration of creation and spirituality in a new way, um, mm. which was so different than, of course, how the Catholic Church did this in the past. And then all sorts of other traditional ways. You know, some of our schools, um, they do an elk hunt. And wow. that is be part of their education, the students' mm -hmm. education, mm -hmm. I think is so, so important and beautiful. And right. yes. we see that, too, in the schools and how they are distinctly Catholic. One of our schools, you look at the side of the wall and there is a a, a mural of Apache Jesus, they call it, where Jesus mm -hmm. is an Apache man with Apache children. And so, oh. you know, that is a gospel oriented mural, but it's culturally representative of the community that we're in. I've seen beautiful crucifixes with, with the medicine wheel behind it. Um, sweet grass, you know, um, mm -hmm. next to a statue of Mary and um, maybe a Sincateri, an indigenous Catholic saint portrayed in murals. 
we see it in language, we see it in art, we see it in how the schools are educating beyond, you know, a common standard. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's the most beautiful and truly unique aspect of, of these schools. And what I think is that that's the Catholic school at its best, without a doubt, a Catholic education, Catholic social teaching, all of those pieces. And it is all the better because it is in a distinctly indigenous school. And the fact that every school looks so different in how they bring that about. I also think a really important sign too is that many of our schools don't have a large population of Catholic students. And obviously forced conversion was, uh, was a piece, a dark piece of, of the boarding schools. And so the families in the community, they might not be Catholic, but they believe that this is a good school for their students to learn, to be a good person and, and a learner. I think that is a really promising sign. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting observation. What are some of the challenges and opportunities maybe of these modern day students mm -hmm. to tie back to that indigenous culture too? Yeah. Yeah, great question. So one of the biggest challenges is that sometimes elders or others in the community, family members, will have a distrust of a Catholic school because of, of their own experience. So that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So we need to navigate that and, and think about how the students who are in our schools currently today, mm -hmm. how is their experience so different? And I think the opportunity is these students can learn in a deeply indigenous manner within a Catholic school in the 21st century. And that that means that the older students are on TikTok, <laughs> right? And <laughs> yeah. it means that the younger students might be able to watch um, Paw Patrol or something at home. And, and, and that's to say, that's not to say there's anything wrong with that. And they they do that and they and they want to do that. And that's great. And they're they're reading books that you know that you'd see at a scholastic book fair. Mm -hmm. And that's that's wonderful and and, and important. And in addition to that, they're allowed to wear their indigenous regalia to school in place of their uniform on any day. Mm -hmm. And they are speaking to an elder in the language that maybe their grandmother grew up speaking. Mm -hmm. um, this infusion of, of Catholic education and indigenous education, it's so important that these students feel that they are deeply indigenous in the era we're in today. And I think our schools do a good job of that with cutting edge educational curriculum and resources yeah. that also come together with ancient wisdom from their community. And and will um, students be interested in that? I think just like anywhere, it's different from case to case. Mm -hmm. But the fact that it's not a, a side of what they're doing, it's at the yes. heart of what they're doing mm -hmm. is Absolutely. really important. And, and, and what I think too is that that the schools we work with do this in a way that really does make the students who come to the school feel part of the community. And, and, and I have a, a, just a brief story for you. Okay. We had our eighth graders, we like call it the eighth grade pilgrimage. We invite all of our schools to come to kind of explore Notre Dame and see, uh, uh, learn more about the college experience as they head into high school. And nice. obviously COVID has impacted that for a number of years, but last year one school was able to come. And it's just, you know, the best days for AICSN are when we're all together at a school or when when our, our schools are all here. And mm -hmm. I was I was walking with a young guy. I think we were leaving the ice skating rink. We're going to the dining hall. And I asked him if he had been at Deal South Blackfeet for a long time. And he said, no, he just came came last year and that he had gone to another school in the area. And I said, mm -hmm. why'd you why'd you switch schools? You know, I'm, I'm interested in this. Why? Sure. Why are students families choosing AICSN schools over others? And he said, well, yeah. you know. I got in with a rough crowd at, at, at my old middle school and uh, got in a lot of fights. And and it it sounded like it was a mutual decision was not the place <laughs> for him okay. to be. I said, you know, I'm, I started to hear that. And I said, I hope I hope things are going better at Deal South Blackfeet. And he said, oh, oh, my gosh. Yes. And he said and he pointed to his buddies walking around him. He said, mm -hmm. these are my brothers. Oh. And um, it was one of the most powerful moments in my experience because what it showed was that the school in all that it does right in in the job of educators father Lou Delfra said this in a homily when I was an ace and I think about it often <laughs> the job is impossible and we're inadequate right it it the task that these schools have is so so significant mm -hmm. but what they're doing how they're able to provide this opportunity an educational environment, that is Catholic, that is indigenous, they're doing something right because this student Absolutely. 
was in such a space in intention mm -hmm. that physical conflict was coming about and how he was able to express himself and, and make sense of the space he was in. Yeah. That shortly after, he's now at a school where he doesn't feel okay. He feels like he's part of a family, like these are his brothers. And you can't really fully measure something like that other than yeah. through through personal witness. But yeah. um, that shows for me all of these pieces about modern day education, about the church, about the local community, that when we approach it really authentically and openly, it can be a community that students feel loved. And that that's that's a really important step. That is such a beautiful story. Thank you so much for sharing that. Absolutely. Oh my gosh, the wisdom of a young guy like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, wonderful. And I'm going to have to get this guy's name and then talk to him. Yeah, too, yeah exactly. It sounds like I want to hear more about that um, as a as such a positive I, he, element. He, I think he'd be very open to a return to South Dining Hall. I'll tell you that they're they're, they're big fans. So if you you get him in an interview there, that'll happen. I think I, I can pull a few strings. <laughs> Oh, wonderful. Oh my gosh. Um, well, I would love after that to go straight into the hope section, yeah. which closes us out. But I have mm -hmm. one more question first about teacher retention and shortage yeah. that is happening. And yeah. and if we can tie that into the wonderful work that is happening in conjunction with Holy Cross College here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think this is very much related to the hope piece Great. For, for me, right? Great. So no doubt. Our schools are facing a teacher shortage of the most urgent and serious degree. We're seeing that in America across the board. And our schools have always struggled with this. And it makes sense because the schools are rural. And oftentimes, the other educational opportunities on a reservation might pay more. So it's mm -hmm. hard uh, to necessarily find local folks who are going to choose this school over another. Our schools, especially in the last year, have all come together and, and talked about this. And they are all facing it. And some of our schools have a high native faculty percentage, and some have low, and, and everyone's seen it in different ways. Definitely the more schools with native local teachers, they, they don't face this into to such a severe degree. So we're, we're talking about it and we're thinking about it a lot and just trying to come up with creative solutions and share them with each other. And, you know, this Holy Cross Fellows Program, which is an awesome partnership with Holy Cross College across the street from Notre Dame, Absolutely. has been around for a few years. And, and a number of our teachers, which is an interesting aspect, a number of our teachers at AICS in schools, they don't have a certification and or bachelor's degree in education, which is new to some people, but that's just the nature. Our, our schools have found good people to teach there without the, the credentials, the traditional credentials. Right. And so we've worked together with Holy Cross to provide an opportunity where a cohorts of AICS and teachers can come and earn their BA degree and or teaching certification through Holy Cross. And it has been one of the most grace-filled pieces. You know, like we talked about at the heart of our work is bringing schools together to learn and share in our unique ministry. And this has done it while also addressing the teacher shortage that these people we've identified, many are, are native, not all those who aren't have, have married into the community or have committed themselves to stay in the community for a long time. Mm -hmm. They've come together in person for two and a half weeks. And, and Audrey, you've been able to meet these people. They take classes, it's intense. And then they take online classes during the year. And the most special bond has been formed. Teachers from Montana, South Dakota, Arizona, all over, some of them indigenous, some of them not, but all sharing in the deepest commitment to their students and wanting these credentials to stay there. And I think for me, this is the sign of hope. One of the greatest signs of hope we have is that in an age where it is so hard to find a teacher anywhere, that we have these men and women who are working so hard full time as educators in what I think is the hardest job possible, while also spending time away from their family, spending time online during the year to earn the credentials. So we've worked really hard to, to provide essentially full scholarships to these teachers because they are paying far more than we could ever do. <laughs> Through their to their commitment and and blood sweat and probably a few tears for their students and <laughs> and 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 I think one moment for me captures this best. Our first person to complete the program happened this past summer, and that was it's a dream long in the making. This idea came about in 2017 or 18, um, and the first students came in the summer of 2019. But this past summer, Kelly Stever finished, and when her certification arrived in the mail, uh, the Holy Cross faculty, some from Holy Cross faculty and myself, we received. Uh, a text message with a picture of it. And she said, my dream is now a reality. And I just thought in an age where people are walking away from classrooms and education, they're, they're running out the door, right? <laughs> that someone that we have the great privilege to work with and witness is saying, this is my dream. 
to, to be able to do this. And now know she can do it long-term for her students. How can you not be filled with hope, right? And how can you not just think that in this age of such urgent need for transformative education for our students in these indigenous Catholic schools, that they're spending their days with someone who isn't saying this is a job or what a drag it is, mm -hmm. or I got to go again tomorrow. She's saying, it's my dream and a privilege to be there. I am moved by that. And I just think what an amazing privilege we have to be able to um, learn from and witness saintly folks like Kelly who share that commitment and love. Well, I'm definitely moved too. <laughs> I might've had one of those tears you were mentioning. That is so beautiful. Um, and an absolute congratulations to her and to yeah. all of you who have worked so hard to to help her along that path. And um, yeah, I yeah. have had that great privilege to to walk with you guys for a few steps. And I am so heartened to hear that that you feel like that's a critical piece to continue to listen and to help in the healing. I would ask you for your hopeful piece, but I think you've infused this whole conversation with so much hope. Um, yeah. As difficult as it is, I can see that that is just a true piece that fills your heart. So thank you so much, Will. Thank you. It, it is uh, such a joy. Uh, if, if I'm not interacting directly with uh, AICSN folks, to be able to talk about them is the greatest dream. And like you said, these schools and these students, these families, these teachers, they embody hope. So it is uh, the greatest gift to, to be able to witness, no doubt. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing these stories with us. And we look forward to continued conversations with you. Thank you, Audrey. So, so great to be with you. I will be thinking about our schools and our students a lot just from this conversation, as well as the history of jack-o'-lanterns and uh, whether to do Starburst or Skittles or Reese's uh, as the holiday approaches. <gasps> Maybe a bowl of each and then you could do your yeah. own study. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We don't <laughs> use or, we use both hand. Exactly. <laughs> we thank say you, yes. Will. <laughs> Yes, yes and, absolutely. Yes, and. Thanks so much, Will. Right. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Audrey. Really appreciate it. And thank you all for joining us for Think, Pair, Share. If you enjoyed this episode, head on over to Apple Podcasts to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. It's very much appreciated. Check out our website at iei.nd.edu forward slash media for this and other goodies. Thanks for listening. And for now, off we go.